Namaste. So let's talk about Vijeshwar Sanghita, chapters 24 and 25. And really, the whole Vijeshwar Sanghita in general is about how to be a devotee of Shiva, how to invoke Shiva's presence, how to get Shiva's favor, how to get blessed by Shiva, how to become knowledgeable and pure. These are all the methods. It's, it's really uh, amazing and very different from most scriptures, how in the Shiva Purana, all these practical methods are combined in one Sanghita, in one section. The word Sanghita means a compilation. So it's likely that many of these different sections on the different methods of pleasing Shiva were concatenated from other sources. And it kind of reads like that. It can be a little disorganized sometimes. So it seems that these uh, different sections were pieced together from various sources, and that's okay. It's not that one person can come up with or even know an entire ancient religious tradition. It's unreasonable to think that because the worship of Shiva was evolved over thousands of years. Shiva is mentioned in the earliest Vedas, the Rig Veda, the Atharva Veda. So the worship of Shiva is very ancient and is an extremely deep and uh, complex culture, especially in South India. The South India, uh, the uh, traditions of Shiva worship go deep into the roots of the society. And they're very hard for anyone to understand who isn't born into it or who doesn't do these sadhanas mm -hmm. and get direct personal experience of Shiva. But that's the point. Why do they put all these methods right in the beginning? Uh, after the auspicious introduction, the Mahatmya, that details the glories of Shiva Purana, the very next section is about how to worship Shiva. So what does that mean? It means that before we talk about who is Shiva or what is Shiva, we want to talk about how to worship Shiva. So this is really considered extremely important, and that's why it's put in the first section after the introduction. How to worship Shiva. And if you're not doing any of these practices, the rest of the Shiva Purana is kind of meaningless. We are not scholars. We are not into knowledge for its own sake. We are into knowledge that leads somewhere, that provides some benefit. And of course, the greatest benefit is liberation. And if a person is not sufficiently trained and motivated to practice mystic yoga, the only way they can get salvation is through devotion, through bhakti. And this is legitimate and it works. And even for those who have obtained liberation, in those whose kundalini has risen and gone through the knots, the grantis, and they have uh, realized themselves as spiritual beings, uh, even those people are benefited by performing devotional service to uh, Shiva. The, I'm a perfect example. Uh, since I began doing Shiva Bhakti, 
my quality of life has improved markedly. I want to say even drastically. And how can I explain this? Everyone in material life feels lonely. Everyone feels isolated and alone. And even you can have a bunch of friends. You can be very popular. You can even be famous, like a celebrity. Huh? You still feel lonely. You still feel alienated. This is the nature of material life. Why? Because we're separated from God. But those dualistic religions, like, for example, the particular brand of Vaishnavism I was involved in for like 25 years or more, they do not provide a real cure for this loneliness, for this feeling of separation. In fact, they glorify it and say that this is wonderful and it leads to spiritual advancement. As far as my experience goes, it simply leads to alienation. Because even after following all the procedures and getting trained up to a high degree in different forms of worship of Krishna and like that, and doing years, literally years, of unbroken devotional service in temples all around the world, I still felt separated from Krishna. And even when I retired in 2001, and I went to Kauai, and I camped out in the jungle and just chanted day and night. I chanted at least 64 rounds, sometimes over 100 rounds a day. I still did not get a darshan of Krishna, uh, or I, actually I did, but just for a very short time, and it wasn't very satisfying. So what happened after that? I started investigating different kinds of mystic yoga. And I had had that experience back in 1984 of realizing Brahman by the grace of Shakti. And so from that, I developed a theory, a working theory, that war, our spiritual life should be based on experience. It should be directly experienced, not a theory, not a belief, not a doctrine, huh? not a philosophy, but a practice that leads to direct experience of God. And this, in my experience, is Shiva Yoga. As soon as I started chanting Shiva Mantra and doing a little puja, you know, nothing significant, but just investigating it from reading Shiva Purana, I got a deep feeling of connection, of merging even with Shiva. And we've explained why this is and how it happens in the little mini-series I did on the Mandukya Upanishad. And we're going to go more into Mandukya Upanishad in the interval now between the Vijeshwara Sanghita and the Rudra Sanghita. Take a little vacation <laughs> and look into some of the reasons why this Shiva worship is so profoundly satisfying. But the fact remains that it is. And I'm not the only one who feels this way. I have a couple of serious students in the U.S who are practicing these things, and they report the same kind of feeling. One of them told me the other day, when I chant this five-syllable mantra, Om Namah Shivaya, I get, like, thirsty for the name, and I can't wait to say the next mantra. And it's like that. It, it goes in a self-reinforcing pattern, a cycle. And this is my experience, too. And this is my, the other student's experience also, that just chanting this mantra is so immediately satisfying. And the more you chant, the more deeply satisfying it is. The other day, when I came back from Rishikesh, I had a long taxi ride, about five or six hours. And I just chanted 
Shiva mantra on my beads the whole time. And by the time I reached my destination, I was so high. <laughs> so this thing works. This thing, this Shiva Bhakti, Shiva Yoga, releases you from the material alienation and separation that plague us all of our days. That taste that we're looking for, which is like the merging with another being, and not just any old being, <laughs> but a perfect being who loves us unconditionally. Huh? I got a little taste of that in Shakta worship, in uh, the Shakti Bhakti. But this Shiva Bhakti is much stronger, much more satisfying even than worshiping Shakti. Sorry, Ma. <laughs> it's true. And she had promised me in a dream some time ago that she would bring me to the feet of Shiva, and she did. And not just theoretically, not just, you know, philosophically, but actually Shiva, love for Shiva bloomed in my heart and I could feel it. It's tangible. It's real. Huh? So this is something that everyone should pursue. And really, the cost of entry is so, so minimal. Just wear Rudraksha, wear a little... Uh, ashes on your forehead, chant this mantra, study this Shiva Purana. And, you know, what can I say? My experience is that the results are more satisfying than any other spiritual practice that I've ever done. And I've done plenty of them. You look back at this channel and you can see my history, how I've inquired into so many different paths. And even before this channel, many, many different paths, many different methods. I practiced them all. Uh, I never speak just from doctrine. It, 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 it's against my nature because I felt so badly burned after 25 years of being a Krishna devotee and still not getting the satisfaction I was looking for. I felt that, okay, I followed this faith thing for a long enough time that by now it should be, you know, evident. It should be plain. It should be clear. It still wasn't. I still didn't get the result that I was craving deep inside. And I think this is every, everyone's experience who follows a dualistic path. Because if I am an eternal individual separate from God, how can I feel that deep connection with God? Unless there's a, a merging, unless there is an actual deep connection, I mean, it's, it's really hard to explain that Shiva, even in a dualistic conception, is so friendly He's so welcoming and kind, you know? If you read uh, or hear the prayers to Rudra, they begin with, please put down your weapons. <laughs> this is a sinful person speaking. He's expecting or maybe even experiencing retribution from Shiva in the form of suffering. So he's saying, please put down your weapons, you know. I'm going to try to worship you, okay? <laughs> but there's a stage beyond that when one becomes pure, when one has no desire in this material world for f money or power or fame or whatever, mm -hmm. right? When all that is let go and one becomes pure, one can approach Shiva and he's so friendly and open and welcoming. So this is my experience, and I hope that you also sign up for this experience and get the kind of pleasure, the deep satisfaction that is the actual result of this enlightenment in Shiva Yoga. Aum Tatsat. Aum Shakti Aum. 
Om Namah Shivaya.